And we have here Gabor, uh, Ella, can you speak about landscape with the river? Yes, I yes, think. yes, sure. Thank you very much. So, so first of all, so there's a problem. So I will talk about an object which is not really probabilistic, and this is a probabilistic <coughs> thing. So I must convince you first that at least it has something to do with probability theory and measure theory. So the object of study is actions of countable groups on the Cantor set. Okay? When I say action in this kind of places, the action is usually borel or measurable. There is no measure so far, and the action is continuous. Okay? So each element acts in a continuous way. And what I will I will talk about is free actions. So what does it mean, free action? I will miss this alpha thing. It just means that if you have a gamma element and then gamma x equal x for some x, then gamma is necessarily the unit element. Okay? Okay, if you wish, you want to see all the orbit graphs. Ah, you know, the KD graph. Okay? If you so, so I will mostly talk about free uh, actions. And there is another simple notion of minimality. Minimality means that if you take any point in the counter set and you take the orbit and you close it down, so you take the orbit closure, it will be the whole counter set. Okay? So that means minimal. So orbit closure of any element is C. So, so first, <coughs> I would like to show you something which sort of, sort of prove that the theory of free counteractions is close to the probabilistic, uh, so basically essentially free measure preserving actions. Okay? So, so, you know, if you have measured actions, so let's say like percolations, okay, then there is a notion of weak equivalence. Now, if you forget weak equivalence, I tell you how it works in, 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 in the counter case. Okay? So, so you have an action. Okay? Now, take a point and take the R ball of the. Oh, excuse me, Michael. Oh, my. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So, whatever. Okay. So, okay. So, you take the R ball in the, in the Cayley graph. Yeah, well, in fact, it makes a negative contribution. <laughs> 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 well, it's no, but it's important for the recording. Okay. Maybe lower the volume. Okay. So, I, I try to, you know. <laughs> so, you take the R ball. And then what happens is the following. If you, have, if you have such an action, then you can take all axes, you take all possible R balls, and then you have a labeling of the R balls with element of the counter set. Am I right? For each X and each R, you have a labeling. But of course, it's, 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 it's an infinite thing. So what you can do is you take all R R ball, Meaning, it's, it's a labeled R ball, but not with the whole counter set, but only with the first R coordinates. Okay? This is a finite set. There's only finite many such things. Okay? 
<coughs> so if I have if I have an action then for each action I have these uh, labeled arbors okay I fix an X I take I take all elements in I fix a, of course a generating set and I take the ball and for each element I, I take the value so for each X I have an element of this thing of this finite set okay so any action can be encoded with many many finite sets for each R one finite set okay now <coughs> Imagine that you have uh, no two actions, okay, alpha and beta. So then, of course, there is there's this very important notion of a factor, okay, that you can have a factor map from C to C, which is equivariant, and and in the case of measure, preserve the measure. Okay, and then you can ask whether the beta is a factor of alpha. Okay, now here we have we have a weaker notion, and this is the weaker notion. Alpha is weakly containing beta. If the following is true, that for any r. Here is this, this is C. I can take, I can take a Klopen partition. Okay. And each partition is labeled by an element of this thing. Okay. And then, if you take an alpha action, then using that, you have, you have a factor, but then each label is just from this 0, 1 to the R. The question is, can I do it in such a way that the resulting R balls are exactly the R balls of beta? Okay? It means that I can model the beta action using the alpha up to any precision. Okay? And if alpha contains weakly beta and beta contains weakly alpha, then we say that alpha and beta are weakly equivalent. Okay? Now, remember, so in measure theory, usually what they do is they not only take which balls are here, but what is the probability you see these balls, and they encode this information. In continuous world, what we do is what sort of ball we see, even once. Okay, that's topology. If you see a ball even once, then you say, okay, this ball is in the set of alpha. Okay? Now, if you know that if you have an amenable group, the three measurable actions has only one weak equivalence class. This is a kind of like a classical theorem. And uh, there's another theorem which is due to many people, Keck, Chris, Tucker, Drop, and Miklo Schabert and me, is that the weak classes form a compact metric space. And there is this famous theorem of Albert, Miklos Albert and Benji Weiss that there is one guy in the measurable world which is weakly contained by all the others, namely the Bernoulli. Okay? So, so <coughs> I want to point out that the following is true. The weak continuous equivalence classes form a compact metric space
and there exists one minimal element, so a kind of like a free Bernoulli. Okay? So again, the Bernoulli shift is a nice continuous action, but very far from being free. It's free in your world because it's almost free. In this world, it's not free because, of course, there are points which are fixed. Okay? But you can sort of make it free, and there is one single element, one single class, which basically the free Bernoulli, and uh, this class is uh, this class is contained in everything. Now it's important to note that, that as a matter of fact, so you have a minimal element, and Benji Weiss has a paper from 2 or 12 about minimal models of measurable actions, and for the Bernoulli shift, if you take the minimal model, this is exactly this class, okay? So I wanted to show you this thing to kind of convince you that the topological version of, so the, by the, basically the deterministic version of measure theory is interesting, okay? And uh, just one more thing before <coughs> getting into the subject. Of, of my talk is uh, another difference and similarity uh, uh, between the continuous world and the measurable world. And uh, I think in one of the talks we already talked about that. So you have, imagine that you have Gn, let's say a Cayley graph, and Gn is locally convergent to a Cayley graph G. And, 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 and there was this, this, this result by, mentioned by Tom, that, that PCG and convert to PCG. There is a much, much, uh, basically very, very easy result that the spectrum of GN, which is a spectral measure, weakly converge to G. Okay? So the spectrum... Weakly convert. Now, imagine now that you have HN graphs, and which are, I will explain, topologically locally converged to H. What does it mean? So first of all, if they are Cayley graphs, it's exactly the same thing. Okay? If they are just graphs, it means that if you see a ball here in H, then you will see this ball in all H and except finitely many, and vice versa. So H and is convergent, meaning any ball is either in all of them except finitely many, or in neither of them except finitely many. And these balls are exactly the balls in H. Okay? So in particular, if they are Cayley graph, then this convergence implies that. But, you know, uh, for general graphs, uh, the life can be more complicated. Now, there is one point. If this is a graph, a countable bounded degree graph, then it always has a spectrum. It's not a measured space. It's just a topological space. It's a compact metric space. Am I right? It's in the 0 to the interval, a compact space, the actual spectrum of of the Laplacian, so all the lambdas, such that lambda minus, uh, so uh, delta minus lambda is not invertible. As we know, this is a nice compact space, and on this compact space, in this case, we have a measure. Now, if we don't have this sort of thing, then you, we don't have a measure. It can be, for example, this thing can be like a unimodular graph, then we don't have spectral measure, but still can ask something. Namely, is it true that we have spectral convergence? But what sort of spectral convergence? Instead of weak convergence of the measured spaces, we have Hausdorff convergence of the compact sets of the spectrum. So what, what we would expect is that, at least in this case, 
the spectrum is convergent in this topological sense. Okay? Not true. Why? Because imagine that this is the free group. And imagine that these are torsion free nilpotent groups which are converging to that. Then the torsion free nilpotent groups has spectrum close, so the spectrum is a whole interval which contains the zero. And of course, here you have a gap in the spectrum. Okay? I was able to prove it's not a very strong result, but at least something that if these graphs, any kind of graphs, have uniform polynomial growth, then you always have spectral convergence. Okay? So the topological world and the, and the measure theoretical world is kind of similar. There are differences, and I just want to say one difference for even for Z. There are continuum many classes. And this fact in disguise was proved already in 2004 by Matui and Lin only for Z. They did not define these classes only for Z, and they classified basically all the weak equivalence classes. Okay? So that's the part I tried to explain to you why I like this category. If you have a graph sequence, he did. If you have, let's say, uniform doubling property, or uniform, is it uniform polynomial growth, all of them together, then of course the limit graph has uniform polynomial growth as well. So, so like if, you, if you take a K graph of finite groups, they don't have uniform because it's. Uh, no, usually not. Only if they. If they Yes, 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 yes. If you have such graphs, maybe not k the graphs, then you have topological convergence. Okay, that's, that's actually true. Now, so I'm getting uh, closer to the topic. And mm -hmm. so. So, three minimal actions on the, on the counter set. Now, I would like to show you, well, I recall two major examples when the group is the free group. Example number one. So, you take the free group and take a net of normal subgroups such that the intersection is 1. Then, so this is finite index, and gamma and k is finite. Okay? Then you have the factor graphs, or the, well, let the factor groups here. And then you can take the inverse limit. So the inverse limit is the profinite closure with respect to these normal subgroups on which the free group exists. The action is free. The action is minimal. And of course, it preserves the Hall measure. So that's one important example. And the other important example is the following. So let's just look at the... Uh, the Cayley graph of the free group. So it looks like that. So you have all the rays emanating from the origin, from the unit, which actually converge to the space of ends, what they call the Friedenthal compactification or the boundary, the natural boundary. So here you have, here you have what well, they say, the delta, the, the boundary of the free group. And 
you can see the boundary of the free group is actually a counter set. Okay? Now, of course, the group acts on arrays, so the group acts on the boundary. The action is free, the action is minimal, and it's well known that the action has no, does not support an invariant measure. Okay? So you have two basic classes, classes with invariant measure and classes without invariant measure. Now, so what can be proved So first of all, it's not absolutely trivial that any, any countable group has a free action on the counter set. It's, it's easy, but not quite trivial. Am I right? Because you, everybody would try the Bernoulli. And the Bernoulli is wrong. OK? So what you can do, I just want to show you what you can do instead of that. So imagine that you have the group. Let's say it's finitely generated. It doesn't mean too much. So you have the group, OK? And, and what I do is the following. Label the elements of the group with the elements of the counter set in the following way. So I call this thing proper labeling. A is that for any R, there exists some epsilon R such that if, if gamma and delta distance in the Cayley graph is less or equal than R, and of course they are not the same, so it's bigger than zero, but less or equal than R, then the contour distance with any kind of metric, which gives you the right metric, is bigger than epsilon R. OK? Quite clearly, you can do that. OK? I mean, imagine, I mean, you can label the graph such a way with, you know, five colors. Then, then, then every neighbor has different colors, and with much more colors than every double neighbor. And then you build up a code with a counter set. OK? So clearly, such thing exists. And then you just take the orbit closure of this thing, because if this guy has this thing, then any element of the orbit closure have the same property with the same epsilon r. And because of that, of course, this action is free. OK? So this is just a, a triviality. Of course, minimality is obvious, because if you have a free action, then basic Torn lemma tells you that any free action contains a minimal action. Now, so what you can ask, question number one, is, is it true that for any countable gamma, you have free action with invariant measure? This is a very natural question, and there's a very strange thing that the answer came so late. So it's Greg Hjort and Moldberg, and the answer is yes. And this is just 206. So, and of course, this is not only a free action, a free C action, so it's on the counter set. So every group has a free action on the counter set, which admits an invariant probability measure. Now, so 
So the next question is, can you make, uh, so what, can you make it minimal? So Benji Weiss has this paper in 2012 where he proved that every group has a minimal action on the counter set, which is not free, but topologically free. Topologically free means that there exists one point, at least, for which gamma x is never x. But it's easy to see if you have one point, then almost all point. Almost all means topologically almost all. So uh, full bear. So a meager, a co-meager set is on a co-meager set is free, and on a meager set may be bad. Okay. So he proved that. And uh, so the, the, this is a very, very nice paper. And the, the, the idea is that it's actually a direct construction. You take this free action, you manipulate. It's kind of like a learning process. You learn the, the action. You modify the action. You learn again the action. You modify, and somehow you get this thing. And uh, so there is a problem. You cannot make easily a topologically free action free. The reason of this fact is that the free group, this is a joint result with Miklos, has topologically free action, which is measurably hyperfinite, if you know. So it's very, 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 very far from being free, okay, in the measure category. Now, so, so I was able to prove that any, any countable group has free minimal action admitting an invariant measure. So the philosophy is the same. It's a learning process, but you want to make the thing free, which is a lot of pain. Okay? So now we know that, okay? So we understood at least this part, okay? So for any group, you have this sort of action when you admit invariant measure. Now, now the question is, is it true that sort of actions like that exist? Now, Oh, I just explained it. It's a, well, yeah, I must explain this thing. So, so this is a bit. Co this is the controversial part. So, how to say a speaker does not supposed to say something which is completely unknown for most of the people. I know that. So that's why I'm in trouble. Now, so, okay. So I, 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 I will be a bit unfair, just a bit unfair. So <laughs> I will use a bit of pressure. How? So, so I, I, I will use authority, okay, argument. So you know, because it's random, so I will use the phrase random walk. How about that? So if you take a random walk on the Cayley graph of the free group, then what we know is that the... Poisson Furstenberg boundary is basically that. So the, the measure, the, this measure is actually uh, concentrated on, on this boundary. Okay? We know that. So this is, there is this very, very classical thing, no authority argument, I think 1978, by Zimmer, when he said that if you have any group, then the action of the group on the, on the Poisson boundary is amenable. Okay, but still I must tell you what does it mean amenable, just because Zimmer said. So okay, I tell you what is amenable. So amenability is called, this amenability is a measured theoretical thing, and it's usually called Zimmer amenability. So it means that if you take if you take 
the counter set here, so this is the counter set now, this is the boundary, okay? Then, of course, uh, you have an equivalence relation, a measurable equivalence relation, the orbit structure. Am I right? So two points are equivalent if they can be uh, moved by an element. And this equivalence relation, so there is a notion of Borel amenability or Borel hyperfiniteness. Okay? Borel hyperfiniteness means that you have sub equivalence relations which are finite. So all classes are finite. And this whole equivalence relation can be written as the union of that. This is the strongest Borel amenability you can imagine. I want to tell you something. This action here has this property. Okay? It's, it's not a triviality. It's, uh, it's a Doherty, Jackson, and Kekris, 1992. There is a conjecture that it's the same thing is true for any hyperbolic group. But it's, it's not now. Okay? So this is not Zimmer amenability. Zimmer amenability is a measurable property. It means that you have the measure, and up to zero measure, this is true. Okay? And as a matter of if the action is not free, then, then the stabilizers are amenable. If the action is free, then you don't care. Okay? So there is a measure of amenability. So you have the measure, and up to zero measure, it's, it's Borel hyperfinite. Okay? Okay? Now, so the problem is, and that's, that's, I must be careful. So there is a notion of amenability, which is a kind of like a parallel notion, and it's used in the context of continuous action, and sometimes it's called topological amenability, or, or some guys are calling it boundary amenability, okay? And uh, I, tr I, 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 I tried, in five minutes, explain to you, okay? So I tried, if you do not know, that I try, five minutes, okay? What does it mean? So, so first of all, so you have amenable groups, you don't care. Amenable groups are nice, we don't care. Take non-amenable groups. Now, in measure theory, we know the following thing. We have amenable groups, we have the very, very non-amenable groups, the Kashdan property T, and the in-between. Okay? And we know, you know, in between means that you have ergodic action, which is not uh, uh, strongly ergodic. Now, so, so it means that in some sense, the in between guys are very weakly amenable. Okay? Now, there is this, I shouldn't call it, of course, weak amenability because it's used for at least three other things. Usually it's called property A. A means, okay? So property A means that looks like a manable. So what does it mean? It means that for each point, you have kind of like quasi furner set. So for any epsilon, there exists an R such that you have for each point in the Cayley graph a set. Okay, which is inside the R epsilon ball. Okay, so this is, if this is X, this is A X epsilon. Okay, so this is a set, not too big. And it's almost like Fulner, meaning if you have a neighboring point, then the two sets are almost the same. Okay? Of course, it doesn't mean that this guy is Fulner. It might have a big boundary, but the other guy doesn't feel it. Okay? So, if you want to see it, the easiest thing is the free group. So, what you do is the following.
take this point and this ray tending to infinity. And then what you do is the following. From each point, take a long ray toward this infinity. Can you imagine that? Imagine what happens if you have two neighboring points. Immediately, the two paths are connected. And then, so the two paths will look like that. OK? Either that or even or that. OK? Can you imagine that? So it means, it means that the free group is amenable or has property A, so you can fake, basically, the Fulner set. OK? Now, if you can do it in a continuous way for an action, then I say that the action is topologically amenable. OK? So it means that you can, kind of like a clopen way, you can pick this set, more or less. OK? Now, what you can ask is the following. Oh, that's interesting. So for amenable groups, obviously, you have this thing. Because you just take the actual Fulner sets. Of course, the actual Fulner sets has this property. For the free group, you have this thing. And if you look at the literature, John Rowe has a famous paper that all word hyperbolic groups has this property. And then you can see other papers which said, even if you have you know, a group of finite asymptotic dimension, it has this property. Okay? So you have this big chunk over amenability, which like, plays the role, which are like, almost amenable. The question is, do we have in the topological world some guys who play the role of Kajdan property T? And for a long time, they believed no. And then Misha Gromov produced a strange group, which on the Cayley graph, you basically have expanders. Into, in, in, into the graph. Course, almost expanders. OK? And, and then Narutaka Ozawa showed that, no, no, no. This kind of group cannot have this thing. And these are called non-exact groups. So as a matter of fact, you have groups which cannot act at all in a topological amenable way. The big difference, if, you, if I ask you, give me a Kashdan property group, you say SLN3. If I ask you, give me a you know, then you say Gromov. No, they say Osida, because then it's Osida has another construction, OK? So there's no, like, a lot of groups, and we can see them. No, we cannot see them, because all normal, nice groups are in the middle. But there are groups which, are, which have this property. And very No, I think Osida, constru Osida has a construction which is almost independent from Gromov and very explicit. For example, it's residually finite. But is it an explicit Explicit. No, it's not. Yeah, it's absolute. It's, there's an explicit construction. You can see it. You can feel it. You can play with it, but not easy. So not for me, not, at least. Okay? So it's much better than the Gromov thing. Because, of course, Gromov thing was, you know, they didn't understand for, for years what's going on. And also, I understood what's going on. OK? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, you don't really need expanders in it if you have, I don't want to get into this. So anyway, these sort of guys exist. That's the point. So, so then, then, so this action, of course, is amenable. Okay? Now, it's known by Scott Adams that any hyperbolic group acts in a topologically amenable fashion on its boundary. So you can ask the following question. Is it true that if gamma, gamma uh, countable has a free a uh, minimal amenable action and, uh, on, a, on a counter set. Topological is that you have this picture, and then you can do it on the counter set in kind of like a continuous way. You can choose for any. Uh, the, this property A picture, you can actually do it on a. 
Now, of course, you need that, provided that this gamma is not the gromov Sida monster. So if gamma is exact, then you have this thing. Okay? And this was proved by Mikhail Rordam and, and Sir Adam Sirakovsky. Now, what they proved is the following thing, that it's something exists which is really strange because <coughs> there is, so you have freeness, easy, minimality, easy, amenability is not so easy, there is a intermediate hardness. There is, on the counter set, there is something which is called paradoxical action. So paradoxical action means that the Banach-Tarski theorem is true for the action. But not only for the whole set, but for any Klopen set. So an action, a continuous action on the counter set is paradoxical if the Banach-Tarski property holds for any Klopen set. What does it mean? Then you can cut the Klopen set, in, so you can partition it into finite many parts, and then translating half of them, you got the whole thing, and translating the other half of them, you got the whole thing. Okay? So this is paradoxicality, and, and they proved that any exact, any exact group has free, minimal, amenable, so this is the very amenable property, and this is the very non-amenable property, together. This, 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 and, and that. Okay? So that's what they proved. And then you cannot prove more, because if it's non-exact, then you, have no, you don't have this thing. You have this thing, you don't have this thing. Now, so I'm getting closer to my river and, and landscapes. So then, uh, then Nicola Mono, and uh, Rordam, and the student of Mono, Julian Kellenhals, here. They prove the following thing. Okay, exactness cannot be incorporated in this model when you have counter set. But if you allow the non compact counter set, which is topologically just the counter set minus one point, or, you know, countable copy of the counter. So this is a unique, locally compact, totally disconnected, non-compact space. Then on this set, you always have a free, minimal, amenable, and paradoxical action provided, provided that the group is non-amenable and contains contains an exact non-amenable subgroup. For example, the free group. So basically, the only question is, if you have a non if you have an Osida monster, which is like, you know, not only an Osida monster, but, you know, it's like a real monster group. So it's only every subgroup of it is finite or, or, or small. Then, then you do not know this, uh, the result. So, so what I proved, is that this is true without any condition. They conjecture this thing in this paper that is it true that any countable group, no matter how, and then I prove this thing. Now, I have how much time? Um, ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Because it's, because it's, this is the point, because it's not on a compact set. It's on a non-compact set. On a non-compact set, it's, 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 it's possible. So, because on the non-compact set, that's the trick. On the non-compact set, when I say this weird thing that, you know, it should be continuous, it should be continuous on the, on the compact set uniformly. 
which means that if you have bigger and bigger set, it should be less and less true. So believe me, the, 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 the non-exile group can have this sort of action. Okay? So, so the idea is using landscapes. And uh, so I, I have this you know, five minutes, so I will tell you what landscape is. So what happens is that, that what I do is I want some <laughs> compact set here, okay, which I, I denoted by A, and I take the full Bernoulli shift on this compact set, okay, and I will, I will take an invariant subset here, and, uh, which is minimal, and y is homeomorphic to this non-compact counter set. Okay? Okay? And uh, so this is the, the idea. And uh, so the A set is, is a bit more complicated than the usual thing. It's a product of a compact set and the one-point compactification of the natural numbers. Okay? So, so what happens is the following. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that I will have time for the river part, but I will have a bit of time for the landscape part. Landscape is just a labeling of the Cayley graph of the group with this set, okay? So for this coordinate, for the C coordinate, the only thing I want is this properness, which was, which was over there. So if two guys are close, that the contour coordinates are relatively far away, okay? And uh, the landscape condition is about the second part. And uh, I don't want to mess this thing up. So the landscape means for the second coordinate, I just, for the second coordinate, I just use H. So H is this thing. So uh, H gamma, uh, H gamma minus H delta. So first of all, a landscape has no infinite coordinates. A landscape, really a landscape, is about heights. Okay, and for the height, if, if gamma and delta is adjacent, then the height are either the same or the distance is one. So this is the first landscape thing. And the second thing is that there exists some, so this is one. The second thing, second property of a landscape is that there exists uh, for any n, there exists some constant that if h gamma equal to n, then there exists a delta such that the distance of gamma and delta is less or equal than this mn, and the height of delta is 1. So it means that it's not possible that, you know, it goes that way. So it spent a lot of time far away from the, from the base level. Okay, so this is the second landscape condition. So the third, uh, the third landscape condition is that if you, if, so there is another constant, uh, what was it, K L N. Uh, such that if, if h delta is 1, then in the ln neighborhood of delta, there exists uh, n elements, n elements gamma, such that h gamma equal 1. It means that if you see someone on the base level, then it's never isolated. There are, there are guys, there are guys with the same property close to this thing. As a matter of fact, there are many. Okay? And 
and the fourth property is that that I don't even write that. So it's oh, it's called uh, well, uh, K n. So for any point, there is another point in the K n distance such that the value is larger than n. So it means that it's not close to the brace level. Okay. So a landscape looks like that. It's kind of really like a landscape. And so the height coordinates. And so what is kind of obvious, uh, this is not only kind of obvious, but it's obvious that if you, if you take the closure of this thing, then there are two cases. Either all the coordinates will be finite, or the second coordinates will be finite, or all the coordinates will be the infinity. Okay? And there are, because of this thing, there is no isolated points. Okay? Because of that, if you take any point, okay, you take the closure and you take out the infinite points, then the remaining part <coughs> will be a non compact counter set. And now you start to play, and then you can construct landscapes. Okay, which has the minimality property, and only play with H. And then, no, I don't have time at all, uh, then you start to play with the C part, and then you can make the landscape uh, uh, both amenable and paradoxical. There's one thing, you need the river. The river is nothing, the river is just that there is a by Lipschitz embedding of the tree. And a river with a landscape is that you have a by Lipschitz embedding of the four tree, and the distance from the 40 plus 1 is a landscape. Okay? And if you have this thing, then you can do that. And uh, you proved that for non amenable groups, you always have, how happy I was when I found this paper, that, that you have always uh, by Lipschitz embedding of the, of the four tree. Okay? So then you play with it a little bit and then you use the fact that the, 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 the four tree, is, uh, the four tree is, uh, is, has property A and it's nicely embedded and then you can actually, using the C coordinates, you can produce such a uh, Y landscape such that the, the orbit closure minus the infinite points uh, actually solving the conjecture of Keller, Haas, Mono, and Rodham. Thank you very much. <coughs> Question, um, <laughs>